everyone. Thanks for joining my session today on reaching audiences of the future through empathy and inclusion. My name is Alison Walden, and I'm an experienced technology craft lead for North America out of our Toronto office and our accessibility service lead. I'm really excited for everyone who could join the session today, so welcome. And the first thing I want to do to start us off right is a group activity. I hope you'll join me in this activity. I'm going to do a guided visualization to center us, depending where you are in the world, either at the beginning, middle, or end of your day, and refresh us for the remaining amazing sessions. We're in the final stretch. So here we go. This will work best if you close your eyes. So imagine it sometime in the future. COVID-19 has been somewhat contained where you are, and many people have decided to go back to the office on some days, and you're one of them. Imagine that part of your commute to work involves a walk and your walk takes you through various neighborhoods. So you pass a bus stop on your walk and you hear one person asking another how to find out when the next bus is coming using the app. Neither of them can figure out how it works, but someone else shows them how to text the bus route number to a number on the bus stop sign to find out how long they'll need to wait. You keep walking and you pass another person talking on the phone with someone, telling them that they've just hailed a cab with an app and will meet them shortly. You hear them mention how, even though the service isn't a new one, they're still struck by how convenient it is to hail and pay for a cab with an app. Really picture all these people. You pass a cafe that just has window service and some people are lining up to order and pay for their coffee. And you notice other patrons skipping the line and simply picking up their completed order that they made earlier through an app. A postal service van stops nearby and you watch the driver get out, open the back of the van and you see all the packages with an Amazon logo or in India, you might see the Flipkart logo or in Europe, maybe you'd see an auto logo and you smile and you think of all the people who will be happy to get their packages that they ordered that day. You're almost at work now. You're passing a big grocery store. You see some employees of a grocery delivery service coming out and holding people's online grocery orders. You notice one of the bags they're carrying has one of your favorite snacks that you've run out of at home and you make a mental note to order some for yourself later. You find yourself imagining the person who ordered those groceries and how they're in for a treat later. You get to your office and you make your way to your team's project area and you see the faces of your team members. You reflect that it's collaboration with these team members that makes the experiences that you work on great. You pause and you consider a few of the people whose collaboration has taught you the most. Really think of them now. Finally, you consider how you and your colleagues may have helped to make or influence the online experiences that you witness being used by people on your commute today. You think of those people and I want you to really try to imagine them now the person at the bus stop, the people hailing a cab with an app, the people picking up their coffees that they ordered, the people who would receive packages in the mail that they ordered, the person who ordered your favorite snack along with their groceries. Really picture them. And now answer this question. Were any of the people you imagined elderly or did any of them have a temporary or permanent disability? I'm just gonna let that hang there for a second. And while we're absorbing that, also ask yourself this. When you thought of team members whose collaboration has taught you most, did you think of anyone in a different discipline? Okay, thanks everyone. You can open your eyes now if they're still closed. I, I bet that for many of you, when you unconsciously imagine the people who use our experiences, they don't have disabilities and they're not elderly. And that's a problem. It can be hard to not have this unconscious bias. But meanwhile, 1 billion people worldwide have some kind of permanent disability that would impact how they must access content or services online. They could be affected by anything from low vision to someone who has a tremor in their hand and can't use a mouse to someone who is completely paralyzed and uses a puff and suck device to navigate online. It could be a member of the world's aging population who doesn't self-identify as needing an accessible website. All these people. And yet research shows that less than 1% of websites are accessible for this huge population of people with disabilities and the even larger population, which would include the elderly. And the elderly population is increasing, by the way. The median age of the world is increasing. 
this population of seniors and instances of age-related disability is only going to get larger. Statistics show that by 2050, the number of people older than 60 years will be about 2 billion and will account for 22% of the world's population. Just as a contrast, today only about 9% of the world is over 60. And that group of seniors is going to be us. Today, if a website doesn't work, my dad assumes it's his fault, but we're internet savvy and we're not going to just take it if experiences stop working for us because the way we need to navigate changes over time. As people whose job it is, to create online experiences, our unconscious bias of what our users are like means that we aren't considering these groups up front in our experience design and development. So not only are we excluding people, over a billion people, when we don't consider people's diverse needs, we're not exploring the full potential of what our experiences could be. We already know that diversity makes for more creative solutions and can solve problems better. Diverse teams have been shown to have better ideas, better conversations, and more innovative outcomes. The benefits come both from having diverse teams and designing for a diverse audience. Politician and civil rights activist Jesse Jackson says, inclusion is not a matter of political correctness. It's the key to growth. We're actually in the midst of a pivotal moment in the world, and I'm sure you can feel it. There's, it feels like a reckoning. Trends in society are not only giving us permission, but are demanding that we be more inclusive. I'm showing an image of an LGBTQ march on Washington for Black Lives Matter this past June. Fighting gender discrimination. Here's an image of a massive women's march that happened recently in Melbourne, Australia. You can tell it happened pre-COVID-19. Hashtag together we rise, hashtag me too. When we see injustice, we're gaining more of a vocabulary to say this is not right. We're more comfortable being allies and raising our voices. It's becoming part of our culture. There's a constant reminder that we don't know what we don't know and that's okay, but there's an imperative now to ask and to be open to hearing an answer that we didn't expect. There's more empathy for people who have not been included in the past and a renewed urgency to make things right, as there should be. Disability rights are being named a major campaign issue for the US election this year. Not that any of the candidates had accessible websites. Here's an image of a recent disability rights march with people holding signs that say disability rights are human rights. We're also in the middle of a global pandemic that's isolating people in their homes and worse exacerbating the issue of accessibility to online content and services for people with disabilities and the elderly. I'm sure we've all ordered something online recently to avoid being exposed to COVID-19. How would you feel if none of the websites worked for the way you navigated? How do you feel that you ended up in the role you're in and directly have the power to influence the accessibility of online experiences? We have a huge responsibility. This is a time when we're under duress and we need to reinvent ourselves and how we work. This is a difficult time, but also an opportunity to awake collectively on the planet. We always should have been focusing on creating inclusive experiences, but forces in the world are combining to make the present an excellent time to refocus on this endeavor. And I'm here to tell you how we can finally solve this problem of equal access to online content and services for everyone. The key to creating inclusive experiences for the growing audiences of the future who will demand them is empathy for our users and empathy for each other across creative and technology disciplines. So let's get started. Okay, let's talk first about having empathy for our users. How do we get to a place where we're feeling what our users feel when they navigate our experiences? Donald Norman, who was the first experience architect in 1993 at Apple, and the first to use the term experience design said this, we're designing things for people. So we need to understand both technology and people. 
Empathy for our users starts with understanding how they use the experiences we create, which requires an understanding of native browser controls, custom controls, and common interaction paradigms. These are our tools. This is our machine that we have to work with, and I'm going to keep calling it our machine. Would it surprise you if I suggested that your conceptual model of how our machine works is incomplete? Anyone who's seen me present before has already heard my favorite analogy. Would you ask someone who has only ever driven a car to design the perfect bike? Of course not. You wouldn't ask them because they wouldn't be qualified. But that's what we're asking our designers and developers to do when they have never used our machine the same way that many of our users do who are people with disabilities or the elderly. So what's a way that people use our machine that you may not have considered? How about navigating with a keyboard alone? I'm showing a person on the left with their hand on a trackpad. I'm gonna call this person a mouse user. And on the right, I have a person navigating with their keyboard and they're not using the trackpad. So many of us are accustomed to navigating with a mouse pointing device. So we create experiences that work really well for a mouse user, but a mouse user can access content in any order. I have that huge cursor there on the mouse user's screen. We all know how a mouse works. You can move that cursor wherever you want and access whatever content you want in whatever order. The keyboard user, on the other hand, has to navigate in a linear way through the content, unless we build shortcuts into our design. And I'm showing the big blue focus outline on the keyboard user screen that shows them what element has focus. You can probably imagine that the keyboard user's experience would be vastly different than a mouse user's, just due to how they must navigate. This is just one small difference of many in navigation paradigms that most designers and developers don't consider or test. But the design must account for these use cases, which are all part of our machine. Many skilled people from our spectrum of disciplines who can deliver complex experiences still aren't aware of the basic functionalities of our machine, like these common HTML5 semantic elements. What heading levels actually mean and how they should be used. Why radio buttons and checkboxes must be grouped with a field set legend. Why we need to programmatically associate labels with text fields. Even something as straightforward as a list. The way these things are coded affects the experience, but usually coding decisions are made by a developer alone with no input from an experienced designer. I called it our spectrum of disciplines on the last slide, and I like that analogy because it explains how we got to this point. We probably all know how a prism works. I was looking at this recently in my son's grade four summer school science class. White light enters a prism and it's refracted into all the colors of the rainbow on the other side. Think of white light as a 90s web designer. Those of us who are working in the 90s and the mid 2000s remember being hired as web designers or my favorite title, web masters, back when a single person was expected to perform all of the functions to create web experiences. Tom mentioned this in his talk earlier today. That's back when all you needed to know to be awesome was some HTML, some tables for layout, a little bit of JavaScript once it came out, and how to make an animated GIF in Photoshop. But as the years passed, our roles narrowed and split. Think of the prism as a web 2.0. Experiences became more dynamic and more complicated. Front-end developers focused on the changing versions of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS different version control systems, some things we don't even use anymore like Flash, the development of JavaScript and CSS frameworks that we had to learn, different ones for each project. Tom talked this morning about a split between devs focused on the front of the front end and those focused on the back of the front end that Chris Coyer called the great divide. Meanwhile, the design discipline took its own journey with people becoming visual designers or experience designers, coming from diverse fields of human factors and psychology, learning their own ever-changing tool set for wireframing and graphic production, always having to consider usability in evolving interaction patterns, responsive design, design systems. This narrow specialization has led us to forgetting some of the basics of our craft. Jeffrey Zeldman, 
father of web standards from back when web designers were white light, saw this coming and said, when we focus so much on mastering an ever-changing torrent of tools and frameworks, we risk forgetting that the purpose of design is to help people. We need to come back to the machine, to our machine, and complete our conceptual model of how it works for diverse groups. This is critically important because the way a developer codes something changes the experience. With the increased complexity of our machine, we've gotten to a place where the experienced designer doesn't know code and the developer doesn't know experience. So what can go wrong? A quick example would be all the things that can go wrong in the implementation of an edit address button. Here's an interface with icon buttons to allow a user to edit each of their saved addresses. The requirement is that when a user activates the button, they can edit a particular address in line on the same page. The first thing that can go wrong is that the descriptive label for the edit button, the one the screen reader announces, doesn't get defined in the requirements. So the developer leaves it empty. Now, when the user's focus is on the button, the screen reader will announce only button because no label has been defined. People won't know what this button does unless they can see. This issue happens because people capturing the requirements forget to define a text label when there's no visible text label in the design. Okay, so here we're not being empathetic with screen reader users. There are variations on this issue. Depending on how we code it, sometimes the image file name can get announced when there's no other label defined. Button pencil.ping is not much more helpful than button. So the second thing that can go wrong is, let's say there was a label defined, but the developer decides to code this button as a link. The screen reader will announce link, edit. Did you know that links by definition take users to another destination? An experienced user, hearing that this is a link, will assume the edit function will take them to a different page just because it's coded as a link. When it doesn't take them to a new page, this is gonna be confusing. The developer needs to code this as a button because by definition, buttons perform scripted actions on the same page. This is a relevant way that our machine works, but it's rarely ever discussed or captured in the requirements. The last thing that can happen if proper requirements are gathered is the button can be coded correctly with a unique descriptive label. But this hardly ever happens unless it's purposeful, unless everyone involved knows the deeper aspects of our machine. Think back to the last requirements that you wrote or were given and ask yourselves if they were complete. If we don't capture the keyboard focus event, if nobody thinks about interaction roles and screen reader labels are not explicitly defined, then the full requirements have not been captured. Back to our friend Donald Norman, he says that the hardest part of design is getting the requirements right. And I get it, that it's really tough to know enough about our machine to understand when, what all of its capabilities even are. That's where the next part of empathy comes in. Empathy for people of other disciplines who can help round out our knowledge of the machine and ensure each other's voices are heard. At Publicist Sapient, one of our core values is inclusive collaboration. Our teams demonstrate a range of abilities, specialties, life stages, situations, and ages to lend a variety of perspectives to our thinking up front. And we also need people to have a deep interest and curiosity in adjacent disciplines. We must consider them as overlapping. How many times have you heard a developer say after she has built a strange experience that the client immediately wants to change? I thought it seemed odd that the user experience uh, was created this way, but it's none of my business as a developer. How many times have you heard an experienced designer say, well, that's not how I wanted it to work, or I didn't know that side effect would occur if we designed it this way? <sighs> Depending what product, project you're on, the project can be led a bit more by design or a bit more by engineering. Without purposefully seeking collaboration with another discipline, things can get siloed. Of course, this is further complicated if another agency is doing the designer development, which happens sometimes. 
We need both the experience design and experience technology points of view to create good experiences because our machine has become so complex that nobody can know everything. If giving voice to people from other disciplines has not been enabled by our project's processes, we need to make it happen ourselves. And we need to explain the urgency to our delivery leads. My colleague, Lisa, and I are gonna talk in detail about this in a few hours, and I hope you can come. In the meantime, suffice it to say that we need to be allies for other disciplines and not be afraid to ask each other questions about the why and the how of our experiences. We must challenge our own assumptions about our roles within our disciplines. What can I decide about the user experience as a developer? What should I decide? Is it up to me if a user experiences content as a list, a menu, a footer, or a complementary section? It kind of is right now, because as a developer, I'm making coding decisions, mostly unchecked. Some developers would use all non-semantic elements, other developers would go as far as to mark up an e-commerce product tile with an article tag. But what does the article tag even mean or do? And is that how an experienced designer would describe the content? These are not meaningless questions. They affect the experience. They'll spark conversations that make our work better. Whose job is it anyway? Is it the job of a designer or a developer to design how the navigation will work for a keyboard and screen reader user? Both. Different markup will affect the experience. It should be purposeful, and that needs an experienced designer's POV designed with a front-end developer's knowledge of HTML. What if the style guide suggests that an H3 heading will always have the same style visually? As a developer, I know in practice that that's never true. Should I say something? Yes, our style guide should be accurate. What if the requirements refer to all interactive elements on the site as buttons because they look like the designer's idea of a button? Should I code them all as buttons or should I ask how each one is meant to behave? Should I let the designer know that there's a difference so that they can use the right language in the style guide? Yes, ask how things are meant to work, explain the options and what they mean. What if there's a glaring accessibility mistake in the design, but it's technically feasible for me to build it that way? Do I say something or do I say, design's not my job? It's all of our job. These are areas where we must collaborate. We need to stop assuming and start asking each other questions and challenging each other. If you see something that's wrong, then share what the problem is and get it fixed. Developers, ask the designer about the why of an experience. Designers, ask the developer how. In the long run, stopping to ask these questions will make us faster and our experience better. But people tell me that although they would love to stop and ask these questions, unfortunately, they don't have time. It's a misconception that when we collaborate more, things take longer overall. This was an idea that was blown out of the water in an industry much older than ours, the automotive industry, when companies transition from mass production to lean production. And it's worth it to take a minute and look at some of the parallels and to take some learnings from history. So in the early 1900s, Henry Ford implemented a manufacturing process that came to be known as mass production to increase the productivity of his factories. Some of the facets of the mass production model included narrowing people's skill sets so that different people could do more specific things faster, focusing on the speed of getting to the next step and never stopping the assembly line to fix a problem. It got so that workers were less likely to even find mistakes early because they no longer knew enough about the other parts of the system to recognize and fix them. Workers who didn't notice problems held back their knowledge to avoid stopping the line. Mass production relied on checkers to, to find mistakes at the end and errors were compounded as they moved down the line, ending up taking way longer to fix. Does any of this sound familiar? Separation of labor and a lack of teamwork led to the failures of mass production. Stick around later for Matt Neiman's talk that goes way deeper on the pitfalls of this waterfall method of creating experiences and how we can fix it. But how did the auto industry evolve to overcome these issues? Process improvements made much later by Toyota created the lean production model. 
Lean production called for workers to broaden their skills, not narrow them. It was more important to know about teamwork than it was to know a narrow specialty. Lean production had skilled workers who could recognize issues early and who felt empowered to stop the line when issues were found. And then the entire team gathered to understand and fix the issue. This led to so much continuous improvement in skills for everyone that soon the line no longer had to stop. Lean production mindset promotes sharing knowledge, asking questions, and proactively initiating improvements. And it's faster. Implementing lean production methods required much less rework and steadily improved the quality in our industry as in the auto industry. Having empathy for each other across disciplines will allow our work to be informed by a larger context. And it's the second piece of the puzzle to ensuring the experiences we deliver are inclusive. And I realize there's a dependency on the delivery lead to get these processes in place for every project. They won't know unless we tell them. So what can you do now? Learn as much as you can about our machine, the native browser tool set, and what semantic elements are meant to do. Learn how to use a screen reader and understand how some people with disabilities navigate online. Watch a screen reader user on YouTube. Start by just trying to navigate with your keyboard. Consider the elderly and people with disabilities up front in your design. They should be included in personas. This is the audience of now and the future. Don't make assumptions. Instead, ask questions. Ask why and how. Run your idea past someone of a different discipline and see what happens. I'm really excited to announce that some mandatory training is coming our way across disciplines to help round out our knowledge of the machine in this area. Look for that this quarter. We also have a new curriculum for XT team members who would like to work specifically on web accessibility. So feel free to reach out to myself or Tom Bailey about that. There's information in the XT global section on Box. We've had the tools to make inclusive experiences for a long time, but not the processes and not necessarily the mindset. Now's the time. An old saying from another design discipline, the field of architecture, is that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is today. Thank you.